And you can see my screen in full presenter mode. Looks great. Yep. Good. Okay. Uh, so thank you, uh, Carlos, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for attending my talk. Uh, but let me just start by saying that the work I'm going to show you today is largely the work of Jan Kun Liu, who is uh, an assistant professor at Rockefeller University, formerly a postdoc in Brian Choi Ket's lab at UCSF. And uh, I wanted to thank uh, for, for financial support these organizations and for software support these organizations. Um, I am going to uh, talk about um, virtual library screening. And um, so there's growing evidence that expanding um, screening libraries um, leads to the discovery of new ligands for new biology. And you know the argument goes, you, you can only find what's in your library. And so uh, uh, as a result, we've been growing zinc and uh, the, the zinc database representing the, uh, the you know, compounds you can buy ready-made. Of course, chemists can make anything for you, but what can you buy cheaply? And um, we're now at 4.5 billion 3D molecules ready to dock. Uh, that's an increase of, a, of about a thousand fold over the last uh, you know, seven or so years. And um, we're making, we're developing tools to make docking um, aut more automatic, faster, cheaper, better. Uh, but on our way to you know, 10 billion, which we can now sort of see in front of us and perhaps eventually 100 billion molecules, we're beginning to wonder, you know, when should we stop growing the library? Uh, when is growth not worth it? Um, and so, um, and so, it's time to take stock of and look at some of the trends in these growing libraries uh, that we're building, and see, uh, you know, is it is this really what we want? Um, so, uh, we're going to tell you three stories about uh, library growth and and what goes into the library. Uh, so, one of them is about Biogenic bias. Historically, this was uh, thought to be very important. Um, you know, uh, privileged scaffolds, natural product inspired. Uh, is it is that a good thing in libraries? Um, second topic I want to talk about is as the libraries get bigger, do the scores improve or do you just sort of rearrange the deck chairs? Are you really getting better compounds? And thirdly is. Uh, what about those artifacts? We all know that there are artifacts in 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 docking molecules that just score artifactually well. Uh, you know, how do we cope with those as the libraries, you know, scale by logs uh, to get you know of, of scale? Um, so this work was already available in Chem Archive, and it's going to appear in Nature Chemical Biology. Um, so let me review with you uh, molecular docking a structure, a database, and a program. Uh, we ourselves use our own program, UCSF Doc, but I think what I'm gonna talk about is pretty general. Um, in, our, in our model, we dock the molecule, um, perhaps up to a sampling up to a, a million configurations of the molecule in the binding site um, and ranking the database from best to worst, uh, picking compounds, that uh, look good to the computer and to us for uh, prioritization, purchase, synthesis, testing, and so on. And you can think of all kinds of reasons why this shouldn't work. And in fact, from time to time, it doesn't work at all, but often it works really well. Um, and so that as a consequence, we are running at any one time, you know, something like 25 large scale docking screens now in the lab in a lab with fewer than 25 people. And, um, and so uh, it's, our, it's, our, it's our hammer that we use for all of the targets we look at. Um, and and uh, you know, the results do vary. Um, it's, it, so notwithstanding all the reasons why you can think of why docking is, is flawed, um, it's worked uh, in our hands uh, over and over again. The hit rates are variable. Uh, the ones I'm telling you about range here from about, you know, 10% up to about 40%. And the best affinities, you know, we we used to say that single digit micromolar was just a great toehold to optimize from. But occasionally now we see molecules in the nanomolar region straight out of docking. And in some studies, we actually see picomolar compounds straight out of docking, which is 
very exciting, anticipating one of the points I'm going to get to later on in my talk. And so as a consequence of this, you know, the fact that we can find compounds um, and, and the availability of these uh, databases of commercially available molecules, we've been growing zinc. And zinc's been growing, well, chemical libraries have been growing now for, you know, 30 years. Um, you know, these are compounds that you can simply order and have delivered. So in the pre-zinc days, uh, the, we started out with, you know, well, back in 1991 or so, about uh, 50,000 50, molecules. And it's been growing steadily since on, on a log scale. Um, so this was, uh, th we had the zinc 12 design where we used to think the MFCD number with eight digits was enough. And then we uh, had this zinc 15 design that we tried to optimize into zinc 20, which was dominated by tangible compounds actually. Uh, and that's, what, that's really what was new and created this big jump up in 2015. Um, so that, that the end of life for that database was about 500 million 3D lead-like molecules. And, um, and so we started work on the next version of zinc, zinc 22, uh, fairly recently. Uh, we got to 30.5 billion in 2021, and we're at 4.5 billion today. Uh, we're actually in a pause right now. And I've speculated that th this is, obviously, this is the future, and I'm not good at predicting the future, but th these are, and these are a reflection more of the number of biologically relevant lead-like molecules that we can, that we can order, that we think we're going to be able to order, uh, rather than the number that are actually built. And so there'll be a somewhat of a shortfall here, because we're, we're pretty well maxed out just building the molecules. Uh, but but another, one thing I wanted to say about this is that we are limited simply by the availability of building blocks. Enamine was making as many as 2,500 building blocks a month before the, the outbreak of war. And, but uh, since then, they, you know, they're lucky when they get to 1,700 uh, in a month. And some of them, those are um, actually... Um, just resynthesis of old building blocks. So the actual growth of the library is capped by the growth of the building blocks. And, uh, you know, but maybe we're going to 150 billion. Okay. Uh, so as a result, we've built this uh, interface. We've integrated um, Enamine together with Wuxi and MQL and Molport and other, other things into our database of uh, make on demand compounds. Um, and it's called Zinc 22, and we're at 4.5 billion. And, and this allows you, this interface just allows you to sort of see what's in the database and, and kind of how it, how it breaks down. So these, this is heavy atom count along the horizontal axis. And this is the, the log P in the vertical axis. It's written in a kind of a funky way. So it's P180 is positive log P between 1.80 and 1.89. And then this is, you know, so correspondingly, but you can see the number of molecules. And this allows people, this allows us to prepare the database once. And then depending on the project, you can select the, the fraction of the database that you're most interested in and only dock the, the ones with the physical properties you care about. Um, in, in two dimensions, uh, so this is now uh, 37 billion instead of 4.5 billion. These are the 2D molecules that have been stereochemically expanded by uh, the, you know, the zinc conventions. So these are um, uh, molecules you can use for analog by catalog, for example, uh, ready, uh, ready orderable molecules. Um, so, so chemical space is vast, we all know. And, and uh, you know, one of the, so back in the, you know, 2008 or so, there was a lot of interest in, you know, uh, why does why does uh, high throughput screening work at all? How do we, given how big chemical space is, how do we ever find uh, anything at all? So here's chemical space, you know, famously ten to the you know twenty four to ten to the sixty three, depending on how you how you uh, set up the rules. But whatever it is, it's massively bigger than what you can hope to physically screen or even virtually screen. And the question is, is if you're in charge of building up this library, what should you be putting into it? And so there was this idea uh, that, so one idea was that nature 
is pre-organized uh, to recognize special molecules. So these privileged scaffolds, nature-inspired molecules, um, and that therefore we should fill our libraries full of molecules that look like natural molecules because then we'll get more hits. And so, and so the people that were actually writing papers about this back in the two, early 2000s. And so what, what do we mean, by the way, by, by biogenic molecules or bio-like molecules? So uh, natural that includes natural products. Um, it includes uh, metabolites. It includes, um, uh, oh, this is more natural products somehow, uh, drugs that are inspired by natural products. And collectively, we're going to call these bio-like molecules in this uh, presentation and in the paper. And so the idea is, um, so, so back in, again, this is work that we published in 2009, but um, se several colleagues, many colleagues published similar things in the, sa the same kind of result. So what we did was in those days, Jerome Hurt looked at the similarity of, well, a proxy for all chemical space. So the generalized database of Jean-Louis Raymond. And he uh, said, well, how um, similar are those compounds, the, the, the purchasable compounds to, the, to everything? And so here's the purchasable database, and here is the, the full generalized database. And along the horizontal axis is how similar the molecule is to a metabolite. Okay, so this is one of the graphs from that paper. And what it shows you is that um, the a purchasable chemical space is um, is heavily biased towards uh, natural product, so towards molecules that look bio-like. And it wasn't true just for the generalized database, but for um, so the purchasable subset of the generalized database, but for all the other databases we could get our hands on, um, they were all more uh, bio-like than uh, just random molecules. So heavy bias towards bio-like. And um, these are open and shut case, seems pretty obvious, uh, but the um, enamine gives us a chance to test this idea. Now, um, you know, what is it, 15 years later, um, so what enamine does is they make these small little building blocks, really interesting little building blocks with, uh, with reactive moieties. And then they set up these parallel synthesis reactions through which they can synthesize large number of molecules that are adducts of two or three of these small building blocks. And they end up creating these nice, compact, densely functionalized, interesting looking molecules and um but they they aren't natural product like at least not in the are they similar to are they similar to precedented you know biologic bio like molecules they aren't bio like in any way so um and so here uh so we wanted to compare the the 3.5 million database so the database we had back in the olden days that we said was heavily biased towards bio-like molecules and compare it with our latest database, the Zinc-22 database. At that time, it was 3.1 billion. So it, an increase of almost three logs. And then this is the work of Jan Kun, as is most of what I'm showing you today. And so this is a plot of the number of molecules in Tenomoto bins, where the Tenomoto to the nearest bio-like molecule uh, from uh, you know, identity all the way through to total dissimilarity. And what you see is that in the region of high, high similarity to bio-like, there is, notwithstanding an almost three log increase in the size of the library, there's only a 2.4 fold increase in the number of bio-like molecules. So hardly anything. Um, and in fact, the, but in this region, the mole, where, where molecules are dissimilar, there's a huge increase. Uh, three three uh, three thousand five hundred fold increase in dissimilar dissimilarity to um, bio like molecules. So the new libraries are heavily biased towards uh, non bio like molecules, um, and in particular, um, so this is the um, so now if we look at just the make on demand molecules. 
um, it's a there's a 400 fold increase in um, so this is this was the um, uh, this was the old you know zinc 15 3.5 million lead like purchasable molecules this is the latest one so after we take it out take out I'm a little bit okay I got confused there's this one so this one I know what I'm telling you this is after you remove the 3.5 million from the 3.1 billion so that you're only looking at the new compounds there's a 23,000 fold increase in um in, or, or decrease in bio likeness in the new libraries so these enamine make on demand compounds are really not bio like as judged by the criteria that we've used in the past okay so heavy bias um and um when we actually look at what happened in different docking campaigns and we look at the compounds that we purchased because they scored well and we liked them and then we look at how uh, you know, bio-like those molecules are. In each of these charts, for each target, you're looking at the the hits are in blue, and the non-hits, so the the compounds that were in, incorrect predictions, are in this sort of orangish color. And what you notice is that they're all in this dissimilarity region. So we're only picking molecules that are non-bio-like. And uh, that's true for uh, D4, AMPC, melatonin, uh, cystic fibrosis. Um, for all of these targets, there's just there's no bio-like molecules. Not even close. John, and, could you uh, clarify how you uh, compute or guesstimate the bio uh, likeness, please? Yes, it's it's the Tenomoto similarity. From the uh, from the molecule to the nearest precedented bio-like molecule, which is natural products, uh, metabolites, um, uh, world drugs, and um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So so these four targets, and then just to to labor the point, uh, sigma two we did the same, uh, CASR, alpha two, uh, EP four. In every case. Uh, the molecules are not bio-like, um, not even close. Uh, so, so much for that old idea that that the reason uh, screening works is because everything's biased towards natural products or or towards bio-like molecules. Um, and um, here, just one more MAC1 and 5-HT2A. So the, of course, it has to be this way because I previously showed you that the libraries are incredibly biased away from uh, bio-like molecules, not because they were designed that way so much as because that's the natural consequence of putting together two weird building blocks in a parallel synthesis reaction. Um, so it you might so you might conclude from this that actually pro, the protein recognition, protein ligand recognition isn't based on these ideas of privileged scaffolds or you know, bio na nature inspired, but in fact that the protein ligand recognition code is is plastic. It's um, it is uh, there's lots of ways of solving the problem, and most of them don't look like the way nature solved the problem. And um, so that's a that's a really big reversal from the prevailing view from the you know 2008 to to, to 2010 uh, era. Um, Okay, so that's my first story about uh, uh, biogenic bias. Uh, my second story is about asking about, um, so now that we've got, um, so, okay. So we had two screens where we've been able to, to not just purchase at the top of the curve, at the top of the, 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 the list, the hit list, but we've been able to purchase all the way down the list. And so, what you're looking at here is the uh, something from the 2019 Nature paper, and this is from uh, the uh, JK's recent Sigma two uh, paper. And in both cases, um, you're looking at hit rate, doc, uh, hit rate from docking um, from experimental testing versus the doc score. 
So the doc score in, you know, these fictional KCALs per mole. And what we did was we, in each case, we purchased all the way down the curve enough, typically, you know, 30 or so per bin to allow us to get a hit rate estimate. And from that hit rate estimate, you get this sort of sigmoidal curve that describes the dependency of, uh, of how hit rate varies with doc score. And as a result, you can integrate the area if you convolute it with the actual population of uh, compounds that have each score, you can get estimates of the number of hits in the database that, that you would have found. And we, we got astronomical numbers like half a, half a million ligands bind D4 out of 138 million, half a million bind at 10 micromolar or better. At sigma two, I think it was 2.5 million out of 490 million screened. So in, you know, when you integrate, it's enormous numbers of compounds. But anyway, it gives you this kind of a model to predict um, hit rate as a function of doc score. Um, the actual region where the, we, 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 we said that the docking stopped was it, the, the, the sort of the plateau region was minus 60 in D4 and minus 55 in, uh, in sigma two. Okay, so. So we we um, we wondered how you know doc score changes and how doc score changes as, as the library grows and so with equipped with this with these models of hit rate dependency on doc score we were able to construct a model and it, and so we we simulate uh, molecules with scores uh, based on you know these prob probability curves. And then we imagine sampling molecules, and we imagine that there's some number of molecules that we're willing to test. And there, so in, the, in some low energy region, and we ask, you know, how does this, uh, how does this change as a function of database size? And so here you're looking at, so this is the, the model of the experiment. And so here is, uh, there were nine library sizes here, otherwise 10 library sizes. And in each case, we're randomly picking from a, a model that generates mo molecules with scores based on the distributions that we've observed by experimental testing. And so then at each of these library sizes, we simulate uh, the number of molecules we'd expect to find in the low energy region at the top of the curve. And what you see is that there's this very sharp um, increase um, as we uh, go up in database size. Okay, uh, so these are all uh, these. It's written very small here, but this is uh, ten units of uh, hundred thousand units of a million at, on the uh, vertical axis. Okay, so um, so this is well, this was a simulation based on ex in experimentally observed. Um, distribution of hits as a, um, for each of the systems that we looked at. Um, so here's another simulation in which we look at, now we're looking at the energy of the top scoring molecules as a function of the, as the database grows. So again, we have a, mo a, a model of molecules, we pick them, and we have, in this time, we're gonna look only at the top 5,000 molecules. And, it, but it doesn't really matter whether you look at the, Minimum, minimum, or certainly the 25th percentile, the median, the 75th percentile. Um, what you see is that as the doc, as the database size grows, um, the best scoring molecules get better and better and better. And uh, this happens for uh, D4, it happens for sigma 2, and it happens for 5-HT2A. So as, <clears throat> what this implies is that you know, off to the right-hand side here, that as we grow the database to beyond 10 to the nine, to 10 to the 10 and 10 to the 11, we can expect to see increases in the best scoring molecules. There is this one anomalous one, uh, curve that I'll just draw your attention to. You can, you've already seen it. The, this is the minimum. So this is the, the very top of the hit list. And the, what you can see is that there's this uh, first of all, it's a big jump up. So there's we often see at the top of a docking hit list some extremely good scoring molecules. And as the library gets really big, you see these um, 
uh, big jumps down. So you're, you start to see anomalously, anom anonymous, <laughs> anomalously good scoring molecules at the top of the list. What's going on? We will return to this topic. Okay. But, but the, the, the take home message from these curves is ever more perfect fits are found. As the library goes, grows, you're starting to find, you find better and better molecules that hit. And this is, this corresponds to our observations, which is it's only when we get into the hundreds of millions and billions that we start to see, you know, nanomolar and even picomolar straight out of docking. Uh, and, and, uh, and so the question would be, well, what about, should we go even further? Okay. So, and what's going on? What's going on with those anomalous scores? Well, what we've seen is that depending on the screen, depending on the, the target you're going after, there are molecules that show up in the top of the list that don't look right. And there, some, some of them are incorrectly tautomerized. Some of them have been, um, there's, there's confirmationally something has gone wrong. There's something wrong in our pipeline, basically our molecule building pipeline. So I'm, I'm the one at fault here. But um, what we've also found is that <laughs> we've been finding these molecules for, you know, for um, 20 years. And uh, every time we put up, put through a new version of zinc, we try to fix the, all the problems in the old version. And somehow there's always new problems that show up. And one, and sometimes they don't show up on any of the systems that we've tested retrospectively, like dude. But then when we look at some new system, something we, we didn't anticipate is going wrong. And so there's this artifact problem and it's a lagging problem because you know, you're always fixing last year's artifacts. So, so what do you do about that? Especially when you're docking in the billion scale, how do you cope with that? So here is the experiment we uh, designed. This is the work of JK again. So in this model, the red colored balls are artifacts and the dotted line is our cutoff for testing. And what we're worried about is that we, as we go from a small library to, to a big library, that at some point, the, the number of artifacts will be bigger than the number of molecules we test at the top, and we won't get anything we, we care about that we, that, that's real. And how do we avoid this? Okay. So, so that's the model. That's the idea there. Okay. And so then we, we, we said, well, how do the artifacts, remember, this is a computer model. How do the artifacts vary as a function of, of docking score? So this is, um, score here okay and so um so we imagined two different models one was an extreme value distribution so that the artifacts sort of bunch up at the top of the list um and the other model we imagined was a uniform one so these are the the, the, the library molecules and the artifacts sort of are uniformly distributed over some you know as far as we're usually prepared to go in the list and so what are the consequences of these two distributions Okay, so so these are heat maps, and I'll and I'll I understand this is a little bit tricky. It's it's taken it the paper takes you through this very carefully, but let me take you through it now. So these are heat maps of the percentages of artifacts in the top n, where n is a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand docked molecules, um, and the percentage of artifacts in the top n docked molecules for a given library size and the ratio between artifacts and library molecules is colored so and uh, white is zero percent and hunt blue is a hundred percent and the um the artifactual models are sampled from the um from the from the distributions based on the em empirical uh experience we have from our uh, previous um uh, docking experiments so, and here is, so, so on the left is the e extreme value distribution and on the right is the uniform distribution. Okay, and, um, and so in each box, these are uh, percentages and these are ratios. Do I have that right? Okay, good. And then, um, so here's our model, here's a, here is this. So 
then we imagine two different pit picking strategies. So the, the percentage of artifactual molecules in the 100 selected molecules between the two strategies. Um, so the first strategy is just pick the top 100 molecules. So those are the black bars. Just pick the top 100 molecules. Strategy two is like this. Um, and you can imagine n variations on this, but this is the one we, we came up with, which is different. So you pick 100 molecules from five ranges. So in log scales, okay? So like these, like this, and like this. You pick 100 from each. And now from each of those 100, you pick 20 at random uh, from each of those. So you end up with 100 molecules the same, but now you've essentially picked down the curve. And what you can see is that when you go, you see that, the um, artifact rate, especially at 1 billion, you just get completely hit. You're at 100% artifacts. But if you pick down the curve, you are at only, what, 23 or 25% artifacts. So you, by picking down the curve and not just picking every single molecule at the top of the curve, you give yourself a chance to sample that, that sigmoidal curve that I showed you earlier for D4 and for sigma 2 as you go down the curve. And so this is our uh, proposed strategy when you when libraries get big for how to avoid getting dominated by and, and basically overwhelmed by um, decoys, uh, artifacts that are created inevitably by whatever process you use. Um, we we are we just uh, always seem to to find these things, and they and different ones show up in different. Um, um, in different uh, for different systems, different artifacts show up in different uh, targets. Okay, so I wanted to start to summarize what I've told you. So, um, compared with the in stock library uh, back, uh, you know, before we started doing the make on demand compounds, the make on de demand libraries are about twenty three thousand times less bio. I should have written bio like bio like. Okay, so that includes. We've included uh, drugs in the bio-like molecule, molecules that are known to be recognized by biology. Um, we have uh, tested high-ranking molecules from large-scale docking. Uh, oh, sorry, tested uh, high-ranking molecules from large-scale docking are dissimilar to biogenic molecules. And we've done this on, I think I showed you 10 different systems and we never find bio-like bio molecules. Um, um, as we as the library grows, we see increasing doc scores, ever better fits of molecules to the binding site. We've done this through simulation, and we've also done it just em empirically when we do docking. For example, we've done AMP C at three million, at a hundred million, and now we've done AMP C screening at uh, three billion. And um, in every time we go up in database size, we see better. We see better scores, we see better fits, and it, we, so we think that the database still can, can grow and benefit us. Um, and uh, some of the uh, increasing doc scores are artifacts. Uh, we've done, again, we see this empirically in our, in our um, docking results, but we've also simulated it in the, in the paper. And the, these, um, Artifacts can overwhelm if you aren't if you don't have defensive strategies for avoiding them, and so our strategy is to pick down the curve. And we suggested one particular algorithm to pick down the curve. Interestingly, we were in order to get those curves to get those sigmoidal curves that I showed you for D four and sigma two. We had to we already were picking down the curve, but for that reason, to, in order to get um, hit rate samples down the curve in order to estimate the total number of actives in a library. Now we're picking down the curve because we want to avoid being uh, avoid being uh, clobbered by artifacts. Okay, and um, so I wanted to uh, just point out that the uh, Zinc 22 has uh, been accepted at JCIM and that it's available as uh, on Chem Archive as we speak. And it describes our new database, our 4.5 billion and growing library. Um, just, I'll just mention that one of the problems of docking at scale is finding enough computers to do the work. 
So we've just uh, put a paper on Chem Archive about large scale docking in the cloud, which you're, and we've submitted it, but uh, we're, you're welcome to look at that. And um, Zinc is available in AWS and Oracle. Uh, both Zinc 15, the old one, and Zinc 22, the new one, are both available in AWS. And um, they're, um, you know, we've done, I don't know, 20 or 30 screens in AWS. So uh, we've, um, and we, we have colleagues who have done it too, and you're encouraged to try to use it. And um, and this talk itself is available as um, uh, in Chem Archive and will soon be available elsewhere. And so uh, that's my uh, summary. And I wanted to uh, thank you very much for your attention and look forward to any questions. Thank you very much, John. Um... That was a great talk. Um, so I can see uh, a few questions here, if I may read them to you. Please. Uh, from uh, Jan Christopherson, many MedChem models rely on the subject of drug likeness. Have you considered investigating this in large libraries to go along with bio likeness? That's one question. Okay, so uh, that, that wasn't the focus of this work was on bio-likeness. Um, in fact, um, there's good reasons for, so when you say drug likeness, do you mean drug likeness in the Lipinski sense of the word or drug likeness in the sense of it resembles some precedented drug? And um, I, let's, take, let's assume that it means in the Lipinski sense. If it's in the Lipinski sense of the word, then sure, the whole basis of zinc is is biased towards lead-like molecules, actually, because it gives you ceiling for optimization. Um, um, hi, hi, John. Yeah, I, I asked the question. Um, the Lipinski model is the one that sort of spurred my question, but I guess the real meaning was, you know, generally speaking, comparing to um, the second point that you raised about just generally similarity of drugs, the same way that you've compared it to a number of different sources of, of biological molecules for bio yeah yeah so you could do it along the you could do exactly that along the lines of what i've described here um you know there's not that many drugs and uh i guess maybe if, if you have a very generous definition and you include grass and uh and maybe um excipients and everything that's been in man everything that's uh but um, you know, I don't think too many small molecules are going to be like cyclosporin. Um, um, yeah, I think you could you could definitely do it. I think it's totally mechanically doable. Um, and Lee has raised his hand, so he was going to ask a question. Lee, I have asked you to unmute. Yes, I'm here. Thank you, John. Uh, so I have a, que a comment and a question. My comment uh, is about the first part of your talk, and uh, it seems to me that the idea that compounds have to be like biologically active compounds is the same argument that people used to make when we were kids that planets only existed in our solar system uh, and nowhere else in the universe and that life only exists on earth and well again we can't prove this but i think it's everywhere in the universe and and it's the same sort of local you know it has to be like what we've already seen right uh to be uh, which i think is an absurd idea i don't know how that got great gained any traction at all my question about this the second part is um did i i may have missed something but is it is the 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 fact that you see such a preponderance of artifacts in the in the high scoring compounds is that just a consequence of the fact that you uh, tend to look at um, you tend to look at a fixed number of compounds from the high scoring compounds in other words if you if you assume that you have a certain fixed percentage of artifacts in any set that are going to score highly if you if you then validate a fixed percentage of what you get, uh, it's still going to be that percentage. But if you're looking at a fixed number, so if you take the top hundred, 
you know, and yeah. you've and you've and you've and you've docked a billion. Obviously, you're going to have many more artifacts in that right. top hundred. Is right. that is that where it comes from? I mean, well, did yeah, I, and you and you can't. And it's it also implicitly. I didn't say this, but you can't afford to to always test the top one percent when you're when you're doing three million. Maybe you yeah, can test. sure, yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. No, and, and so that. the, the percentage yeah. the yeah. percentage of compounds goes down, and the risk of artifact domination goes up as libraries grow. And so you. You need us. You need to at least have a strategy for how you're going to deal with that. Right. Okay. Thank you. That's. Uh, I just want to make sure I had that right. Thank you. So there's a question from Richard Chelminski. Does not the limited number of reactions create a similar bottleneck as limited number of BB does? Oh, it's even worse. <laughs> it's even worse than you say because eighty percent of all the molecules are made by amide condensation. Uh, so it's it's not just that there's 170 pr uh, reaction protocols that enamine uses, but there's really only, uh, you know, almost all of them are created by a handful of protocols. So there is, uh, th that is also definitely limiting in terms of the number uh, of the diversity of the library and the, uh, and what parts of chemical space get explored. I guess the point I was making was that even um, that, and oh, and so if you want to grow the libraries faster, one way to do it is to add new building blocks. But but even if you add building blocks to the most populated uh, categories, which are carboxylates and 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 uh, basic amines, uh, you you still you, your the number of molecules you can generate. You know, even even though it's a table of a two or three dimensional table, the number of molecules you're going to generate is limited. Um, whereas if you can introduce a new reaction and if you can, a, a new reaction with new synthons and you can go digging for, and you can put together molecules in a new way, you have a, the potential for, uh, uh, creating enormously new sets of molecules that have never been seen before because you're putting together synthons in new ways. And this is a, a focus of ours. Uh, it's, we call it the chemistry commons. And it's uh, exemplified by the paper that just came out with uh, John Elman and Brian Roth and Brian Scheuchert, um, uh recently in science. And it is uh, where we built a library of tetrahydropyridines uh, and showed that those molecules, we put, John Elman designed this chemistry that puts together building blocks in a way that wasn't being done by enamine. And that led to, uh, 75 million new molecules, uh, and, and it didn't require the synthesis of any new building blocks. Did I answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you very much. <laughs> and I have another question, actually, because uh, maybe I, I forgot my voice, I'm sort of going over some cold, but um, my understanding was that most all of not most of this most if not all of the artifacts you mentioned the high scoring tops of molecules are due to certain um errors basically yes so i i mean so this is the case then um i mean in and it very i understand stuff is a big numbers everything else but if this is the case that you know the solution would be to basically keep fixing these problems. As far yes, as yes, that, that is a good idea. And we've been doing that all the way along. Uh, 10 years ago, we had uh, sulfones that had problems. Uh, there was something wrong with the parameterization of the charges on sulfones. Uh, we fixed that. Uh, then we had problems with, uh, you know, so we've had um, different problems at different times. And uh, uh, there may be someone out there who knows how to build a, a perfect database. But our experience is, is that no matter how careful we are, there are always problems that we don't anticipate that show up, that only show up uh, when you screen large numbers of molecules, sometimes with unusual um, functional group combinations, and um, that uh, they, but they, they're always there. And the, and the only way you find them is by docking and then looking at the top scoring list and saying, what's this molecule doing there? And then you say, oh, we made a mistake when we built this molecule two years ago. Okay, so the next time we build the library, let's fix that problem. 
And then you screen against another target and you find a different molecule scoring well. And you look at it and you say, why is it scoring well? And is there some other reason? And, and I've been doing this for 20 years and they keep showing up no matter what we do. Probably there is some kind of saturation at some point. <laughs> yeah. So I have another question from Ian uh, Christopher Son. You mentioned that as the library grows, the doc score improves. Do you have any impressions on the question? Is the magnitude of the doc score improvement sufficient to justify the effort of further expanding the library? This is a, an interesting yeah. question. So doc score alone is, you know, who cares about a doc score? Uh, but a nanom nanomolar and picomolar are genuinely exciting to most people we talk to. And so when we tell people that we find a 180 picomolar compound uh, with no SAR, just with no, uh, you know, analoging, just straight as a docking hit, uh, you know, people, we get people's attention because uh, they say, well, you know, that's not very common that you'd expect to find, you know, picomolar in a, in a screening library. And you say, well, did you screen, you know, a billion molecules? And they say, well, no, we didn't screen a billion molecules. We screened something less. So, um, so the doc score is somehow indicative of the potential for ever better fits, which uh, at least in some circumstances, uh, you know, get turn out to be genuine measurable affinities. So two things. Thank you. Thank you. So could you uh, send back the control back to me? I will be try to show oh, one yeah. page and see if that works. Thank you. And then the screen. So you guys can see this one. Can you see the screen? Looks black to me. No. Oh well. So never mind. Um, okay. So uh, another question from Michael Robo: Could you provide more details about your strategy of picking down the curve? How far down the curve do you go? Well, so uh, if you, so the way we did it with D four and sigma two was to purchase every every three kcals, we bought, you know, 30 or 40 compounds. Um, but the reason we, and we went way down farther than we needed to, and partly because we wanted to get a baseline lo low hit rate. You know, we wanted to get down to zero so that we could integrate the whole curve. Um, in general, you don't know where that, uh, where that point is. So, um, so the strategy we proposed was fairly conservative um, in terms of, you know, it was, it was organized in logs. So it's, it's, it de-risks the choice, at least for the first purchasing round, by purchasing from bins of 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, a million, you're sort of protecting yourself against being too concentrated at the top or not going deep enough. And if you, I think if you were to do one set of purchasing at, at, with those log-based bin levels and then sort of get a hit rate in each, so even if it's a small sample, then that'll give you some more guidance about how far down the curve you can safely purchase. Thank you. So are there any other questions? Well. Let's thank John Irwin once again for that okay. great talk. And thanks a million, to, uh, John. Thanks for listening. Uh, great pleasure. Take care. Okay. Thank you all. Bye-bye.